Okay, so hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is João uh, uh, Vasconcelos. I work for the OECD. It's a big pleasure to be here with you. Uh, it's also a challenge, as you know, to, to try to chair this session uh, after the lunch break in the second day. Uh, in any case, given the topic and, uh, and also the interest that nor normally this kind of areas can, uh, uh, can bring, we'll try to make this session as uh, interesting, as active, as provocative uh, 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 as possible. So the topic today is how to uh, basically bring the citizens on board, mostly from a, a perspective of governments and for assuming that as the, the title of the session says, that two heads are better than, uh, than one, and how to mostly bring the civil society uh, on board to work with, uh, uh, with government. So during this session, I think we have here a very good panel of, uh, of, uh, of speakers. I have, uh, I have on my right Miss uh, Paula Forteza from the French National uh, uh, Assembly. I also have uh, Mr. Alvaro Ejera uh, from the, uh, the government of, uh, of the city of Buenos Aires. And uh, I have also Ms. Anna Neves uh, from representing the civil society from, um, from Noman. Uh, before giving them the floor, I'll try just to, to introduce you here uh, a little bit on our, on our topic. So, and to start with, uh, this was based on the discussion that I had previously with, with the speakers, that is trying to understand what is, and being general about it, what is the general perception that, uh, that citizens, or eventually uh, uh, civic tech uh, organizations have regarding governments. Uh, and we, when we talk about government, we talk really uh, the institution, uh, the public institution uh, as a whole. And one general perception, and we can talk with every citizen out there, is that governments are complex. They are, uh, they are big uh, machines, difficult to, uh, to understand, difficult to, uh, to manage, and also div difficult to interact with. Sometimes even, uh, citizens look at governments from a perspective that, um, okay, they are big machines. They are also trying to always try to have some kind of control of procedures on how to direct uh, uh, citizens in terms of services, managing expectations of, of citizens. So also this perspective uh, uh, sometimes uh, comes up. And even if we can jointly uh, think about these two ideas of complexity, of, uh, of uh, big control, even of uh, uh, a bureaucratic perspective, that's a, a bit the, the, the figure that, that, that we have from government. So they, they can be quite scary for, uh, sometimes. And I think you can share this vision um, uh, with us. I'm being, trying to be provocative here. But mostly, uh, we, I think we have a general understanding that citizens look at governments, at public institutions as locked institutions. So with some uh, that sometimes are opaque, not very transparent, dif difficult to, to, to understand, and sometimes even not really uh, willing to cooperate with, uh, uh, with citizens, although so, some efforts are being done uh, uh, from that perspective. But I can assure you, and working with, with governments uh, all over the world, from OECD member, but also uh, partner countries, when you try to get the feedback from government officials about how to work with the civil society, how to have engaging uh, uh, policies, how to bring the citizens uh, on board, we have, pers uh, uh, we have perspectives like this one, like let's be open and collaborative, let's bring the citizens, let's give them voice, let's, uh, uh, let's share data, let's uh, uh, do all kind of events to, so that citizens can have some kind of co-responsibility, some kind of co-ownership uh, of the policies uh, that, that, are, that, are, uh, that are being put um, in, in place. Mostly from a, a perspective of being open, being, uh, having a open government and, uh, and, and make it really, really um, uh, uh, an institution that wants to, to bring the citizens on board. Sometimes even we have this kind of perspective that is you have public officials that are so committed, they are so happy about having the, the citizens on board that they have this kind of naive perspective of hey, best friends forever, so let's, uh, let's have everybody here uh, to, to, to cooperate with us. But I can also assure you 
that this, something, this sometimes also happens. That is, governments do a big effort to bring the citizens on board, the civil society, the companies, the academia, uh, all kind of stakeholders, and by one reason or, or another, and that's one of the, the things that, I will, that we would like to discuss with you, the civil society is not really responding, uh, 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 responding to the, the, the calls of, of, of government. Sometimes some initiatives are, are put in place, and actually, uh, whether we're talking about open data, uh, participatory budgets, all kind of crowdsourcing initiatives or others, so the civil society, the one that, uh, that demands uh, to be heard and to, and to participate, it's not really there. So, Trying to be provocative again uh, uh, about this. So the main issue of this uh, of uh, of our discussion here uh, today is precisely how to make sure that governments and citizens, uh, through uh, digital technologies, are really able to, to to work together. How to manage the expectations of of both sides? Which kind of winning perspectives or winning approaches can we have to 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 really have this kind of good partnership and good uh, good uh, collaboration? So I'll give the floor to each one of of my of my uh, of my um, uh, speakers here in the panel to to give uh, uh, so they can share their perspective on this. So I'll start with Paula and the perspective from the national the French National Assembly. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I think maybe the question can be also reversed. Uh, maybe we can say uh, it's not that the, we have to bring citizens on, on board, but we have to bring institution and political uh, representatives on board. Uh, we have in this like tech for uh, politics or tech for public uh, affairs uh, movement to, to big families. We have the open government and now open state movement, which is more of a bottom down, uh, top down, sorry, uh, uh, movement, which has been gathered around the, the OGP, the Open Government Partnership, uh, where we have a kind of network of reformers coming from a little bit all over the world, and with, uh, which are doing this effort of trying to be open, to do open data, to launch all kinds of, of initiatives, but that have trouble sometimes uh, to mobilize uh, communities and civil society. Uh, and we have on the other side uh, this civic tech movement, which is uh, more, which, which comes from civil society, uh, where we have tools that have been used more uh, during uh, social movements, uh, uh, like uh, in France, Nuit Debout, we have Indignados uh, in Spain, uh, we had occupied uh, Wall Street in, in the US, we have the movement in Taiwan, and we choose these tools to take uh, collaborative decisions and uh, to, to mobilize uh, citizens and, uh, and to work uh, together. Uh, but that sometimes can get a bit isolated and can um, and that sometimes didn't get the political impact they were hoping for. Uh, so I think these two movements are kind of um, losing strength. And uh, I think that if we want to, uh, to save them or to, to, to make them uh, uh, obtain their, their results, we have to make them work together. And uh, that's the only way we will have a real political impact and that uh, things that come bottom up will trigger real political decisions. That's, that's the real issue. And um, in order to do that, we have some examples of people coming from civil society that got uh, political responsibilities. We have uh, Pablo Soto, for instance, Audrey Tang. Um, I am very humbly trying to do the same, uh, coming from civil society and getting a, a spot in the National Assembly and trying to hack the system from within and trying to uh, yeah, make it change uh, by infiltrating, let's say, institutions. Um, and so I think that's the way uh, to go, but we need to scale this up. We, we can't all uh, only um, rely on some individuals that are doing this uh, in a kind of isolated way. Uh, so how are we doing this at the National Assembly? Um, we, we are trying to go beyond uh, these, uh, these platforms, these participatory platforms that have become kind of like um, 
like playing fields uh, where uh, political uh, decision making uh, guys say, okay, uh, you kids can play around here and we, the, the, the adults, are taking decisions on the other side. And when sometimes um, all these participatory uh, initiatives are uh, manipulated and used uh, for communication uh, aims uh, and uh, where anything that comes from these platforms uh, doesn't translate in real political decisions. Um, and so what we're trying to do is, is say, uh, let's map all the entry points, all the moments during the legislative process where a participatory element can be plugged in. And so not only do uh, one consultation that is uh, isolated and that goes, uh, that happens uh, like uh, a way of the, the political process, but let's uh, plug in citizen participation, citizen arguments uh, all along the process. And so, for instance, in the legislative process, we have the moment of the agenda setting that can come through petitions. We have the moment of uh, the amendments, the moment of the discussion uh, between MPs, uh, the moment uh, where we uh, follow up the implementation of the law, the moment where we evaluate uh, the, the impact of the law. And in all of these moments, um, a citizen uh, can contribute and can have a word uh, or, or something to say about it. Um, so there's a lot of tools that can help us do that uh, in a more dynamic, iterative, and yeah, dynamic way. Um, and so in a more technical way, how, how we do this, um, because one of the, the challenges of all these platforms, because Today we, we have the tools. We have so many tools all around the world. A lot of them are open source. We can uh, use them uh, from one country to another. Uh, the problem is not the tool, but it's how we can uh, outreach or make the, the right people get engaged uh, on the platform or on the tool. And I think we have reached the point where citizen get engaged, citizens respond to consultations, citizens participate, um, but they don't see that they're getting more and more frustrated because they don't see that this translates into real decision making. And uh, how we're trying to, to uh, like uh, take the problem the other way around and say we will, we will first think about tools that are useful for MPs in our case uh, on their daily work uh, for instance, a platform to uh, manage uh, amendments and where we're sure that they will use it because it's useful for them, it's practical and it's uh, something that will uh, simplify their, their work. And then we plug in features, participatory features on this tool, like a uh, voting system or pro con arguments, etc. So that uh, we already have the influential people uh, on the platform and they are like organically exposed uh, to this uh, expression, citizen expression. And so we're trying to do this and, and it's really starting to work. And uh, we think it can be, um, it's an experiment, but we think it can be a way to uh, turn the, the problem around. So that's my first. Uh... <laughs> oh, okay, good. As you know, as you can see, I'm not a tech person. <laughs> I work for the government. We are learning, but it takes some time. Um, well, uh, at the beginning of the, of, 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 in your opening remarks, Joe, you talked about you know how to bring citizens and, and civic tech organizations on board, um, and for us, that that's a, that those are two very different venues. We, I must say that we are very good at bringing citizens on board, and we are not so good at bringing civic, civic tech organizations on board, and that's something. That is a, it's a, it's something it's, it's a challenge. It's something that we we have to improve. Um, this slide has some examples of of all the citizen-oriented policies that that we have. Um, last year we launched an online particip uh, participatory budget project, which was extremely successful in terms of the quantity of citizens that part participated. We have, we got more than two, twenty six thousand proposals. Uh, we recently launched a project that's called uh, Comisarias Cercanas, the open police stations. So once, once a month, every first th Thursday, the police stations, which are more than 60 in the city of Buenos Aires, are open to the public, and the, the chief of the police station must be there 
with some members of the local parliament and members of the of the executive branch to be accountable to city citizens to listen to the citizens and to learn uh, from their problem their problems yesterday i told you about our platform on part, uh, public works uh, and and also the city mayor and the deputy mayor have town hall meetings three times a week each of them so we can say that we are very close to the citizens and we do are, are, are doing our best to try to listen to them and to process and capture all that information. And I, I think that's, that's one of the key areas where civic tech organizations can, can help us. We are obtaining lots of information and we're trying to make a, a proper use of it, but I think we can, uh, we can improve and we can, um, we can learn a lot by the type of work that civic tech leaders are doing and the, and the type of uh, projects that have uh, been discussed over the, the last uh, two days. And at the same time, we are having problems at the city level in finding civic tech organizations that are that focusing on cities and specifically in public services being delivered uh, in, the, in the cities. So that for us, is, I think, is one of our uh, biggest challenges. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, we're opening spaces where this collaboration with civic tech organizations could, could, to, to, could take place. We're, we're broadening the civic space, we're, we're building new venues, um, for, for enabling this type of interaction that so far, as I said, is, has been mo uh, mostly focused on, on citizens. Um, we are part, we are members of, now full members of the Open Government, government Partnership. As a city, we were, we were one of the 15 pioneers that joined OGP. Now we are full members. We have uh, hackathons, we have this uh, town hall meetings, we have an innovation lab, so we, we have many spaces in which we could improve the type of collaborative work uh, with civic tech organizations, and, and in fact we resort to them um, uh, quite frequently, but it, this is, it's on, 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 let's say, on, on, the, on a demand that is generated by the government. We are reaching out to civic tech organizations for help, and it's not the same, you know, uh, let's say backwards. I mean, the, the, we don't get uh, many requests from civic tech organizations. I mean, and, and I think, you know, I'm a former civil society person, um, and, uh, and I know the power of agenda setting that organizations have. So I think that there is a lot of, uh, of potential on, on that field. Uh, right now, we're working with the GovLab in a project called the Civic Challenges, and we are trying to get their help to resolve together in a collaborative fashion uh, with citizens and public officials, setting teams, you know, mixed teams of citizens and public officials to solve problems that historically in the city could not be resolved. So we, we do realize that sometimes, or for most of the time, you know, citizens know more about their neighborhood than, than public officials, and we want to bring that intelligence, that, that knowledge into, into the process of policy making, and I think that for that purpose, civic tech organizations could make a, a, a huge uh, different, difference. And, and I think we are doing, uh, I mean, the, we have a gap, and I think it's, it's, it's our fault. I, don't, I think we are not, uh, we do not have the right tools to convene civic tech organizations, uh, and, and that's probably our, our main challenge. So thanks a lot, Alvaro, for this perspective from lo local government. So give the floor to Joanna from the civil society perspective. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you very much for, for the invitation to be here. I feel very humbled <laughs> because I'm just uh, personally interested in the topic as a, as a citizen. Um, and it's, it's really weird being the last one to speak because you basically said it all. And I was also curious, thinking that it's interesting to have such a strong spotlight on us because <laughs> I think it kind of mimics what really happens, which is a huge spotlight on citizens, uh, but also on government to do something. And I think the problem is we're still seeing citizens and civic society as a separate entity from government, and I think that's one of the key issues. Um, I had prepared some notes, which I will scrap because you said it all, as I said, uh, but I will pick on something that Joao asked, which is, 
why is civic society not responding? Uh, and I think I can talk for myself, but also from lots of different uh, civic society organizations that I, I know and, and I interview. Um, and I think it comes from a huge disbelief, because even when government opens the doors, you still wonder how really open is that door. And there is a lot of focus on government creating tools uh, for crowdsourcing ideas and for people to vote on ideas. But then your ideas and your votes, um, what happens to them afterward is still a very opaque thing. Um, so, in a way, yes, you're opening the doors, but on the other hand, there's something that it still fosters and promotes this spirit of disbelief. Um, and the other thing, which I think is probably in the root of everything, it's the lack of engagement from when government does things, the citizen is not there from day one to even build the concept of the tool. If you're creating a platform, you're expecting the citizen to use the platform, but the citizen was not involved in the process of creating it. And the same thing happens in civic society projects, uh, to be fair, which is citizens have great ideas, um, civil society organizations have great ideas, and they go ahead and do it, and sometimes not consulting and involving the government from day one. Um, and these, I think it's this lack of engagement from day one is probably what's the, the core or at the, the root of the, of the, of the issue, of this, the mistrust, because I think there's a mutual mistrust here. Um, the other thing, and it's part of this mistrust that is sometimes promoted by this openness, um, th how many open data portals do you exist in the same country? Um, it's just unbelievable the, the amount of the, this willingness to be open and opening your data. And me as a citizen have this idea that if you're opening your data but you're making people to go to 20 different sites to get your to find data, you're not being that open really. Um, and this is just an example of I don't know, the almost dividing to conquer uh, and not being really, it's almost like institutions, institutions are more worried about stamping the initiative and saying we did it rather than really active, acting collectively as a group in the public interest. And that I think it's also a, a, a cause for this mistrust. Um, the other thing, and I'm just going to pick on something that Paula said, uh, which you use a really interesting expression, which is hacking the system. And we are in a great audience. We understand totally that, that what that means. But it's interesting how many people see that as a negative thing. Hacking carries a huge negative term. And as, as change carries, it's, it's almost equivalent in that sense. Hacking and changing, it feels very threatening because at the end of the day, government are people and they're human beings as well. And if government needs to be conscious about the language it uses um, outwards, I think we as civil society need to be very careful about the language we use in converse and communicating with government because there is mistrust there as well and we should not promote and, and um, this mistrust. Um, and I guess finally, what I would like to say just for this intro is, I think, um, and I'm, and, and this is very, very much a personal opinion, although I know it's shared by many, um, I don't think it's for the government and the public institutions to do the work and create the platforms and make it all happen because I don't think that's necessarily your role. I think civil society has much of an interest in making things happen as government should and it's okay for civil society to take the reins and make things happen. I think it's important for government to find a role and accept a role as a facilitator and almost as a scaffolding. I like the idea of a scaffolding, someone who's there to support and make citizens and civil society go higher. 
because I think there are many, we were talking about two heads, there's millions, billions of heads around the world. There are more heads outside of government than there are heads inside government, and that's math. Um, and I think government needs to acknowledge that and respect that and embrace that as an opportunity rather than a threat. So thanks a lot. Um, I think we had very different perspectives uh, here and uh, they are complementary uh, among themselves. So let me probably uh, make you a first question uh, before giving the floor to the audience. That is, we discuss more and more um, in the OECD and it's not a new concept, um, the issue of looking at government and, and trying to follow go government as a platform approaches, so meaning the government tried to, to uh, be open, uh, defining guidelines, standards, and having a different attitude towards citizens to really bring them on board and co-create with citizens uh, 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 several solutions. So it's, as I told you, it's not a new concept, but it's something that we really feel that even in OECD countries and in most advanced OECD countries in digital terms, it's still something that is uh, being developed uh, right now. Do you think that's a good approach that, that should be followed? Yes, no, what are the, the key issues that should be uh, considered when, uh, when following this kind of approach? I don't know, Paulo, do you want to yeah. start? And, yeah, yeah um, I, I'm very okay with this concept. We speak of um, uh, National Assembly as a platform or as a plat um, okay. uh, how do you say uh, Parliament as a platform let's say <laughs> so we, we borrow the expression to apply it to uh, to the Parliament and uh, but we see it more in in tech terms in terms of um, okay the, the administration of the National Assembly should uh, give resources to civil society open data open source code, open APIs, uh, give the, the technical infrastructure so that we have uh, these um, actors all around that can develop uh, apps, that can develop services that are alternative and that can um, yeah, give more um, tools uh, to to MPs to uh, to politics to politicians etc um, so we think we think that should be the way to go that the, the institution gives uh, the basic resources and gives uh, the whole liberty to uh, this community to, to create and to uh, to flourish um, but we think one of the the points that is crucial for this to happen is to uh, have this this community around that um, that trusts the the system and that I think the trust issue is is key um, and this work uh, in in the long term where we have a relations a relationship that that gets uh, that create that get created and and nourished uh, on the long run and uh, to do that, for instance, we have launched um, uh, with my team um, a project that's called the Bureau Vert in French. It's like the, the open office. So every Friday, I open my office and I bring in and I invite anyone who wants to come, really. But uh, it's, uh, it's uh, civic tech initiatives. It's developers, designers, journalists, uh, economists. And it's kind of a continuous hackathon because we all know that in hackathons you never have the time to do what you wanted to do and it's always a bit uh, frustrating in terms of, of re results and products that you can develop. And so we follow up projects uh, on the long run and, um, and it makes them understand how the, the, the machine works from within and what are the real needs of the MPs so that their, their services and their projects are really responding to the, these needs and so that we, have maxim, we can maximize uptake uh, afterwards. Um, so I think, yeah, you, you have to have the, uh, the technical resources that, I, that are opened up by the institution and you have to have this constant dialogue so that the, um, the apps and the services that are developed respond to the real needs. And that's the way you can have an ecosystem that, that works, I think. Thank you. Um, no, I, I totally agree. I think, I mean, uh, I agree with the approach that the government, you know, has more 
it's a platform as long as it has more resources. You know, in some way, it's an uneven field I think, in which I think governments have more responsibility. Um, but 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 I do think we have to be very. We have to pay a lot of attention to some issues that uh, Anna brought up. Um, for example, when she when you mentioned the, the the problem with open data and open data portals, we we feel the same way. We invest a lot of money on those portals, but we are we don't know who's using them, or we know who's using them. Using them, it's a very small public, and we're trying to improve them to make their to make them more relevant to average citizens. And probably, uh, what we're trying to do is to give more public value to information, right? To uh, you know, I think that uh, I also agree with you with the fact that the government cannot do everything, and all, not all the apps and all the platforms should be done by the government. You know, if the government's open the information in the right format, there should be uh, uh, virtuous collaboration with civic organizations uh, or companies like I don't know, Google that uses transport information to improve the, their, their their apps. So. Uh, I, we uh, are very concerned in terms of generating a public conversation on the importance, the, not only the importance, but also the relevance of information uh, and data. Because if we fail at that, I feel like this, this uh, open government movement and the, all the open data will be you know, just a fashion that will you know, go by. You know? and if, but if we succeed in making these tools and these strategies relevant to citizens, there will be a demand for that. There will be an electoral demand people would, would care about when, when, when it comes to, to voting. So I think that's, that's a, a major challenge that, that we have uh, at the time of making these reforms and this, this, this approach to government uh, sustainable. Anna, please. I'm a computer, I have a computer science degree, uh, so platform in my language means technology, <laughs> but I have also the rail to the soft side, uh, so for me it's no longer the technology, it's the technology and mostly the people who use it. So when we look at government as a platform, I think, yes, it's the technology, but above all is the culture that surrounds the technology that will empower people and encourage people to use it uh, for what we intend them to use. So I think um, it, it's really important that government, yes, embraces these initiatives and opens the data, but also makes sure that that open data is used every time it communicates and people are encouraged to use it. And it's great if government does hackathons and engages or invites civil society to use the open data and create new apps, or if they open the data and say, yes, it's here for you to use. But it would be so much better if then they would say, come here, find a date, and see all these great examples of what citizens are doing with the open data. Um, because it's also, and we, we talked about the mistrust thing, um, it's also, interesting when um, government uh, creates these open data portals and makes data available and creates its own tools of looking at the data because I as a citizen and as a scientist if you want will always question if the the visualization that is being offered to me is the one that interests the government or is the one that I should be interested in as a citizen but uh, here's this this bit is a provocation <laughs> So thanks a lot. I think we, we've heard, uh, again, different perspectives here. Several ideas are right now in the air, let's call it like that. So I would like also to give you the floor and to, to, so you can put some questions to, to our speakers uh, here. So um, probably I'll collect a uh, first set of questions. Yeah, we have it there, please. Can you please just identify yourselves and yeah. Hi, thank you. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, my name is Anna Coulomb from The Open University. Um, there's a growing body of evidence on the importance of offline or non-online only spaces of citizen engagement uh, for truly transformational change. So I'm wondering how much um, governments uh, understand the potential of using online in combination with already 
um, powerful and existing offline spaces. And because perhaps I'm thinking, uh, it's not that citizens are not on board, but maybe we're not knowing how to engage or how, where to reach them. So it'd be interesting to hear more on that from you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if we have other questions. Yeah, there, please. And also in the first here, and then. Thank you so much for those interesting thoughts. My name is Eshpan Kwesiga from Parliament Watch. So I come from Uganda, and um, in Uganda, when we had the presidential elections on the debt of the on the polling debt, the internet was shut down. And um, so what happened was, uh, you know, a few brilliant people came up with this thing called VPN, and they literally in almost a day taught the entire country how to use the internet with, uh, if you have the main internet service providers shut down. So the government said that it was because they didn't want the opposition parties to announce their own results, which they said would, you know, lead people to just flood the streets in celebration of wrong election results. So anyway, they later reconnected the internet. Um, but more and more we see the same government using the same internet, especially Facebook and Twitter, uh, as a platform or as a tool to make public announcements. Two months ago, the president recently uh, fired the head of police on Twitter. So um, I guess my question to you is, um, from, and, this, and this is a question to all the panelists, from your experiences, um, I guess how far have your governments gone in as far as using uh, some of these tools to make public announcements? I'll just collect, thank you. I'll just collect one last of this first round of questions. I'm John Burris from Transparency International. Um, I, I will first start with a comment by saying, I think you are expecting too much on technology and data because, I mean, obviously, I mean, people developing technologies, they are computer scientists, they are not social scientists, so they cannot provide solutions to, to any kind of engagement issues or, I mean, they can just contribute to existing solutions. So that will be my question to you. When you want to engage, for example, women from a specific region or engage youth politics, what exactly is your approach where we can apply technology? I mean, I'll be happy to hear which, which solution you have where I can put my brain on and think about something I could develop that could help to enhance this solution. So thank you. We have already three questions. So I'll give the floor to, to, to our speakers. Uh, Paul, do you want to start? Yeah. Uh, yes. On the, um, the first question on how to, uh, or, or on the level of importance for us, uh, on how to articulate uh, offline and online uh, participation. I think it's it's key, and we have always done it uh, that way. Uh, anytime we launch a consultation or, or a participatory process, we all always do uh, contribution uh, events uh, all over the territory, and we go uh, to the places. We go to schools, we go to universities, we go to clubs, we go to, uh, uh, with the help of uh, associations on the local level, and I think that's the, the only way to reach uh, publics that we don't reach uh, eventually uh, uh, by only doing something online. So I think it's key. Um, then we have on internet, uh, and how, how um, do uh, government uh, and, uh, and political, um, political figures use internet to do public announcements? Uh, so in France, we have, we've had a movement of political renewal uh, with uh, the Macron and the En Marche movement, uh, which brought in uh, a lot of people coming from civil society and a lot of, of, of uh, young people, uh, people that are very used to uh, use social media and to use internet. And this has changed a bit like the, the practices. Uh, and um, uh, we have a lot of, of ministers, for instance, that uh, do uh, uh, Q&A sessions uh, online on Facebook, for instance, on our, uh, or, or that use regular, regularly sorry, social media to communicate and to uh, make political announcements. So this is something that in France at least is uh, getting uh, like uh, stabilized as a, as a practice. Um, 
the last question, I'm sorry, I didn't understand it very well, but maybe my colleagues can, I can come back uh, to it afterwards. Quickly, uh, offline participation, I totally agree with you. It's extremely important. Uh, first, because there are part, you know, sectors of the community that do not use technology or does not have, do not have access to the internet. And, and uh, we have seen in cases of uh, ground-based, or you know, uh, I don't know the, the term in English, but ground-based, part non-offline non participation um, in, in, for example, for urbanizing some uh, like shanty towns or favelas within the city of Buenos Aires. And they, those mechanisms were extremely successful in terms of the effect uh, and the impact. Uh, substantially probably more than our online mechanisms because it helped resolve very deep-rooted problems of the city. Uh, as internet, the use of networks and uh, social networks and internet for making announcements, uh, I think it's, you know, social, you know, political communication is changing all the time and yes, you know, lots of politics is going on online and uh, in the city of Buenos Aires, for example, we have um, cabinet meetings that are broadcasted in Facebook. So I think this is something that is it's, it's everywhere now and it's uh, unavoidable. And, and for the last question, if I got it right, if you were talking about how to use technology for people who is not using them or bringing more, giving them more access, we, we're focusing, uh, I, I agree, there are, we have identified large sectors that are not using technology or or cases in which, for example, elderly people that have a problem of being lonely because their the relatives are not around and they do not ha know how to use the internet. So we, we are developing a special program that uh, we give them tablets for free where they have access to uh, the, the, the things that they, they, they want. I mean, it was the, this project was developed after a consultation process with and a, like a research project with elderly people and it has like uh, uh, panic buttons uh, access to medical information or to and to their medical records you know all type of things that are uh, conceived to satisfy their needs but of course that there are many sectors that need to receive more attention and could be benefit more from from uh, new work by governments We're in Portugal, so uh, we're talking about the online and offline uh, question. I think I need to encourage you to have a look at what the Portuguese government has recently done with the first um, national-wide participatory budgeting process, because um, although the voting was online, all the gathering of ideas was initially offline. They basically went, the government uh, went, um, the Secretary of State, in fact, went around the country uh, and had face-to-face uh, -face meetings uh, engaging with uh, local uh, entities and they worked the ideas. So they engaged the elderly, the people who don't use tech but have real needs. So in a way, it kind of also answers the third question, I think, at least it's a, an example of how it can be done. Um, and they, they literally worked with the people. Uh, what's your pain and how can this pain be construed and, and uh, used to create an, uh, an idea that is good uh, nationwide? Um, and obviously the, the voting was then done online, but the core uh, was born offline. And I think it's a really interesting, there are flaws in the process. Um, I'm the first one to identify them, uh, but I think it's a, it's a really, really good first approach. And I think it, it deserves uh, your attention if you can. Maybe I can come back on the last question if I, I, I thought about it a, a bit. I think you're, you're talking about kind of not having a, a tech solutionism approach or, or not uh, uh, expecting too much on technology. I, I think the approach to, to have is to say technology is not an end in itself. It's a means uh, for a political will or a political program or a political action. And there's always behind, yeah, uh, yeah political action to put in place uh, with this idea that technology is just a tool and a means to towards a, a different end. But I don't know if I understood. We can chat afterwards if, if not. So thank you. Um, more questions? I see uh, one, two, three, just there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Hello, good afternoon. My name is Marco Nopaki from ITS Rio, Brazil. Uh, many of you uh, have talked about the division between solutions created by civil society and government. Um, at, at ITS, we always try to think our projects as multi-stakeholder solution by design to potentialize social impact. In your opinion, what are the biggest uh, challenges to think civic solutions in a multi-stakeholder solution by design? Good afternoon, my name is Jessica from Kenya. My question is about the difference between civic tech and civil society. Um, I, is, it, is that that your, in your countries, majority of the time, civic tech is run for, by organizations that are not civil society or just techie companies? And when, what would be a good model to work with in your experience uh, in, the, in, in the different challenges that you face in your day-to-day -day lives? I think we have one more there. Yeah, please. Hi, John Bruce from Transparency International. Um, it's really great that we're having this talk with you know, government and civil society on the same table. But I think there's an inherent selection bias just by virtue of you being here. You know, you're, you're already reformers and modernizers. And you know, not every politician does the amazing thing that Paula is doing with opening the office on a Friday and letting um, developers and journalists come in. So I was wondering if you, and I appreciate my question is very context dependent, depends on the political economy, but I was wondering if you have any advice on how civil society can engage with politicians who are less willing to listen to us and who are not reformers and modernizers and uh, some maybe anecdotal or specific advice you might have on that. Thank you. So I saw, yeah, let, let me get another one. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Bruna, I'm also from, from Brazil and uh, I'm president of the board of Open Knowledge in Brazil and also I lead the area of knowledge and innovation in an organization, a nonprofit organization that works with public servants in over 100 cities in Brazil. And our perspective is that the public service is some, somehow uh, the first, first social control. So in terms of tactics in this movement that we are talking about in civic tech, my question is how can we make better use of public ser servants in this movement towards openness and what are the tactics that you've seen on this? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have already four questions, so I'll give the floor to the, the speakers and ask them to, to be as focused as possible. Okay. Okay, so just uh, talking about about tools and about how uh, we can make a, uh, civil society and governments work together. And um, we we had last year launched a, a project called the OGP Toolbox. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about it, which is kind of a, a mapping of all the uh, existing civic tech tools uh, designed or by civil society or by the government. But more importantly, uh, where we uh, tell stories about how these tools have been used or reused uh, by different actors. And what is very interesting is to see uh, yeah, how we have this uh, bash of tools that are uh, open source and that, that are, I, sorry, are reused at the international level. For instance, uh, in France, we are using a lot uh, Democracy OS, which has been developed in Argentina, and that's the... the um, the software that we use t today to make consultations in the French National Assembly. We also uh, were, uh, use um, a, a software that was developed in Iceland to uh, make um, uh, to crowdsource questions to government uh, in um, in the National Assembly. Uh, we just had the chat uh, that you're using uh, Decide Madrid to make open budget uh, in Argentina. So that's how interesting, that's, that's the richness of this movement and how international it got to, to be. Um, and I think that maybe answers, I don't know, some of the questions, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to be <laughs> as concise as I can. And uh, regarding uh, how to uh, onboard uh, other politicians that are not yet familiarized 
familiarize with this um, with this uh, way of, of working. Uh, we have this challenge at the National Assembly. We try to for, form them uh, on digital issues, on how to use digital tools, and always with this very practical approach. How these digital tools can help them uh, simplify their daily uh, tasks and their daily lives and their, their job. And that's how they get, they get to, to uptake and to, to see the interest in it. And then we move on to uh, consultations, to uh, more uh, developed and uh, complex um, like collaboration systems. Um, so, yeah, I'll stay at that. As for the question on uh, the first one by Marco, I think that um, w one interesting approach is to is, is to have case studies proving the the, the, the advantages of multi-stakeholder approaches. And that you know most of the most public officials in Latin American countries are not. Uh, uh, aware of the advantages that these tools have, and that's why many times they they do not use it. Some, also, it's true that I mean they are more uh, time consuming, so it, probably you cannot use it for all parts of or all the yeah all the elements of the policy making process. But for sure, there is room for for more use of these tools. And I think one of the problems is one of the challenges is the, the lack of uh, knowledge. So. Doing case studies and peer learning probably it could be a, a good approach. Uh, and then on the question of civil society and civil texts, uh, whether or not they are the same, at least in Argentina, what we see is we have a large civil society movement, uh, but it's, uh, let's say, um, um, not old fashioned, but they, they, I mean, it's more, they, they have a, an institutional reform approach. You know, they are more political scientists. Uh, economists, sociologists, and on, uh, on the on, on the other hand, we have very few organizations that have technological skills. So that's like a very scarce uh, um, asset in, in in our society. And that's what, with my presentation, where I was trying to say, well, we need more invest investment on this type of organizations, because every, everything that relates to evidence-based policy and the you know all the evidence generated by data. It, it put public officials, you know, on, a, on, on the spotlight. So it's, it's a good way to improve uh, policy and to make government officials uh, accountable. And um, how to engage politicians who are not reformers? Well, we, you know, we need to use this type of alliances. I, I, I used to be a board member of the local chapter of Transparency International in Argentina, and now I'm working for the government. Yeah, so... I'm all the time telling my uh, my friends, I was going to say my former friends, but we're still friends, uh, <laughs> my friends, uh, well, you know, how to support each other in, the, in this type of process. And, and I think that type of alliance is very, very important, especially in governments who have open spaces for, for civil society or for experts to, to, to bring um, governments that are mostly dominated by, by traditional uh, politicians. Um, and, and also for the last question, what I see in, in, in Argentina is that most uh, government officials are not very aware of the open data movement, for example. So when I, we go knocking their doors telling them, you know, we run the open data portal, do you have data sets? And there's 30 seconds of silence until they, you know, you, you realize they are not familiar with that. And so, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done uh, towards you know the core of the governments, we are thinking of having like an uh, an open data school or like an open data training program, which is an idea that uh, our friends from GovEx, Eric Ruiz and his colleagues gave us. I mean, we need to generate more awareness within the government, more capacity within the government to be able to to use these tools and and to be m more aware of the advantages of these tools. Very quickly, uh, in terms of uh, what I perceive to be the main difficulties or um, of, of working uh, with multi-stakeholders, I think one of the, the hardships of working with government from the civil society perspective is um, 
there is an electoral mandate, uh, which is in Portugal is four years. It varies from country to country, and that influences a lot the commitment, the time, the priorities, and what civil society perceives to be a big issue today. Maybe it's not a very interesting one for media to cover, or for the government to see as a priority, and that has a huge impact on the, the level of acceptance and openness to whatever you're trying to create. Um, in terms of engaging civil servers, um, uh, servants, sorry, um, I, I like to think it's about inspiring them. I I, I worked uh, in the government in the in the UK, uh, so I was on the other side, <laughs> um, and. Um, I see a lot of hardworking people, people who are committed to their work and love to do a good job. And sometimes they just do not know how to do better. So I think it's, the, I like to think that it's a, it's a matter of inspiring them. And it's not about teaching them what maybe what is about open data, it's about what open data can do for them and how it can enable and empower them to do a better job. Uh, so I, I like to think about inspiration as, as a motto. Uh, more so than information, which I think it's scarier. Um. So thanks a lot. Um, I'm looking right now at the time, and I think we're we're really yeah really uh, really need to finish this. Probably you can address some questions here to to our speakers uh, during the um, uh, the the break. Uh, in any case, before closing, uh, I would like to to invite each one of our speakers to. If you could share with us uh, one lesson, one thought, uh, one request here to this uh, civic tech uh, audience based on your experience uh, during the last years, what would be a key message, a key idea that you would like to share? Okay. Uh I, I would have loved to have the opportunity to listen more to your stories and uh, your use cases or, uh, or the, yeah, the, the examples that you have of uh, civic tech um, initiatives that really had a political impact or that translated into political decisions or, and, and why do you think that was? Maybe we can launch like on Twitter with the hashtag civic tech, like some kind of examples if you have something to say so that we can go on uh, exchanging about that and have some examples after this uh, to, to share and to, uh, and to, yeah, to share outside of, of this conference. Thank you. Very short. Help us, please. <laughs> now, we, you have tools and solutions that we are not familiar with. I know, as, as I said, I'm not a technological person. I have more of an institutional reform background. And these two days, speaking of inspiration, for me, it was uh, every every presentation I listened to uh, was, you know, I, I, I immediately identify something that could help us, you know, to solve problems that we have. I was, during the break, I was telling John from Google how his project on, on health, providing health information, immediately I, I thought of one problem we have in the city of Buenos Aires with, with migrant, migrant women who, that do not go to the hospitals because of cultural reasons, and how we could use that type of idea to solve problems. I mean, I think we need to find uh, mechanisms like this forum, you know, to or have more this of this type of encounters to to get to know each other, to share the ideas. We are we are very uh, hungry of this type of, of uh, ideas. Um, I guess uh, I'd like to, to to invite us all, uh, me included, to start thinking more of. Uh, we civil society against them government, but more of a we who people who care about or versus people who don't care and don't care in the sense of maybe don't know enough to care about these topics. Um, so, but I, I think this, this is a, a different me versus them idea. So thanks a lot for, for sharing this. Thank, thank you, Paula. Thank you, Alvaro. And then thank you, Anna. I think we had 
a lot of ideas that were shared uh, here. For sure, we will uh, start having or we can continue our discussion uh, uh, during uh, uh, the break. And I think you can all agree that this is a continuous effort. This is not, we're not trying here to, to find one solution, one answer, or even a pack of answers. It's a continue, uh, continuous process. Uh, and I think that's also the commitment that each one of our uh, speakers here uh, had. So thanks a lot. And um, okay, see you around.